Good evening, I'm Pastor Bob Bew. We have with us tonight our brother Mark, our brother Seth, our host George, our sister Nicole, and we represent Word Alive Fellowship, which is a teaching-oriented ministry that has been around for about 20 years. And at wordalivefellowship.com, you could find out a little bit more about our ministry. It's just that it's our prayer at Word Alive Fellowship that we experience the mind of Christ. Now this is an allusion to a scripture in 1 Corinthians 2.16 that talks about we have the mind of Christ. Now what I'm wanting to express about this thought is that the Greek word Christos is translated literally into English as the person that is anointed. And the, the masculine is used, so it's the guy that's anointed. And Jesus is the one that's anointed. And the idea of the anointing throughout the Bible in terms of going back to the Old Testament is that the person that's anointed has got the Spirit of God upon that person. The Spirit of God making the king who he is making the prophet who he is, making the priest who he is, and Jesus being the guy that's anointed, having the Spirit upon him in that special way, makes him uniquely the king. Jesus is also uniquely the prophet and uniquely the priest. So what we want to do at World Life Fellowship is to continue to pray that we will have the mind of his perspective as the king, his perspective as the priest, his perspective as the prophet. And we also desire to know what the very name of Jesus means as defined in Matthew 1, verse 21. Now, just for a quick review, let's go to Matthew 1, 21. Just a quick review of Matthew 1, 21. And to set this up against its background in Scripture, Jesus is about to be born. He's got a mother, Mary, or the Hebrew would be Miriam, and he's got his mother, Mary, or Miriam being engaged to Joseph, who is a descendant of King David, and Mary ends up being pregnant, but the Holy Spirit is given credit for impregnating her, not a human being doing the impregnation according to the text of Matthew 1, which essentially begins at Matthew 1.18, so we might as well go back to the beginning of the context in Matthew 1.18 because I said I wanted to do 121 where the name of Jesus is defined and it's our prayer at Word of Life Fellowship to experience a revelation of the meaning of his name at least this is what we're seeking and yet I figure well it's better to go back to the beginning of the context in Matthew 1 and just begin at verse 18 so Nicole would you be able to read Matthew 118 mm -hmm. the, birth of, the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way his mother Mary had been promised to Joseph in marriage. But before they were married, Mary realized that she was pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Okay, so this is how the birth of Jesus, the anointed guy, the, the king, the priest, the prophet with the spirit on him. This is how Jesus, the anointed guy, came to be born. His mother Mary, or Miriam, is promised in marriage to Joseph. Now, did it say anything more about Joseph there as you read that in Matthew 1.18, Nicole? Um, verse 19 talks about Joseph. Okay, so, and so just for the sake of introduction in Matthew 1.18, Mary is promised in marriage to Joseph, but she's found to be pregnant, and yet the Holy Spirit is given credit for impregnating her. Mm -hmm. 
implying that it's not a human being that's responsible. But Joseph is assuming he's got this girl Mary or Miriam that's promised in marriage to him. So he's just assuming that, that it was another guy that impregnated her. And as a result, read what it says in verse 19. Her husband Joseph was an honorable man and he did not want to disgrace her publicly. So he decided to break the marriage agreement with her secretly. So he's, he's a good guy, so he doesn't want to publicly disgrace Mary by breaking off the marriage engagement with her that in Jewish society would have been a disgrace because you were supposed to keep that marriage engagement. It was not something that was optional in Jewish society. So to be publicly disgraced would mean that everybody knew in town that you broke off this marriage engagement. And yet, while Joseph is considering secretly breaking off this marriage engagement, what does it say, Nicole, in verse 20? Joseph had this in mind when an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. The angel said to him, Joseph, descendant of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife. She is pregnant by the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He saves, because he will save his people from their sins. Okay, now now here's the thought that, that's really interesting. In Matthew one twenty, where Nicole is reading that Joseph is considering the option of just divorcing her secretly, because in Jewish society at the time, it would be the effect of a divorce if you broke that engagement when you were promised to be married to the person. It was so seriously taken by the Jews at that time that if you broke off that engagement, it would be like you divorced the other person. So he's considering this as an option in Matthew 121 of, you know, secretly divorcing her in that sense. But while he's considering this, an angel of the Lord comes to him in a dream and says, don't be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. Because what's conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. It's not another guy that's involved. She's a good lady. You can go ahead and marry her because the Holy Spirit's up to something. So just go ahead and marry her. Don't, don't divorce her like that. In terms of what it meant in Jewish society to break off an, an engagement like that. But then something about the character of Jesus is revealed by the words of the angel to Joseph in the dream. And what is revealed about the character of Jesus, Mark, in Matthew 121, the statement that the angel makes about Jesus that's going to be born out of Mary, you know, the one coming out of Mary now, that's going to be born. What is the essence of the character that is attributed to this child to be born given the fact of the meaning of his name. So Mark, if you'd read that in Matthew 121. And she will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for it is he who will save his people from their sins. It is he, Jesus, who will save, and the Greek word can also mean heal. Mark is familiar with Greek from a number of years in graduate school doing work in the kind of New Testament Greek that makes me feel competent to know that I'm in better shape with Greek because Mark is here. But in Matthew 121, he will save the Greek word sozo can mean save or heal. So that there's an application of save, which we hope to talk about tonight. And there's also another aspect of the meaning of the word sozo we hope to talk about as well, and that is heal. So the first level is to save his people from their sins, and the second level is to heal the people from their sins. So he's going to do something about not only the guilt of sin, he's going to cancel it, but secondly, he's going to heal the person of the very issue that causes them to sin in the first place. It's just that the aspect that Mark just read us in his version, read it again, Mark, in Matthew 121. And she will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for it is he who will save his people from their sins. Okay, now when it says he will save, 
okay, his people from their sins. It's interesting for me to see that the Greek verb means at a point of time he will save them from their sins. Now what is the significance of at a point of time? Well this means that what he's going to accomplish in canceling the guilt of their sin is going to be done at a given point of time and it's not something that's going to be repeated it's not going to be progressive. It's not going to be an ongoing process. He's going to, at a moment's time, save his people from their sins. This kind of reminds me of the prophet Zechariah. George, could you check on the prophet Zechariah and see what he's got to say as I give you the chapter and the verse? I'm going to find it. And then I'm confident in the Lord by His mercy that will let me know which chapter and which verse for you, George, to read to us. Okay. Okay. The prophet Zechariah is chapter 3, verse 9. Zechariah chapter 3, verse 9. Now, Seth, would you happen to have this? Um, to read that, this prophet Zechariah chapter 3, verse 9. Zechariah? Yeah. Okay, let me find it. Now, George will help you. George. Help him find the prophet it's Zechariah. Right Matthew. It in, uh, Matthew. Right before Matthew. Two books. Yeah. Just before. Uh, Two pages before Matthew. Seven, seven pages. So, okay. Second verse. I wrote the cross next to it. Uh, what chapter and verse? Uh, chapter three, verse nine. Alrighty. See the stone I have set in front of Joshua, there are seven eyes on that one stone, and I will see engrave an inscription on it, says the Lord Almighty, and I will remove the sin of this land in a single day. Okay, now this is interesting, Seth. Joshua is the name of the high priest at that time, mm -hmm. and Joshua is a Hebrew word that means the Lord saves. Okay? Jesus who is born later on because we're earlier than Jesus' birth when we're talking Zechariah chapter 3 verse 9. But Jesus is being prefigured or prophesied of in a certain sense in this very passage. Because this high priest that you read about named Joshua, that is the same name that Jesus has in Hebrew because Jesus' Hebrew name is Joshua. In other words, you, you'd fully pronounce it Yahashua. I mean, if you fully pronounce it, Yahashua. And then in the times of earlier men, actually, I was going to say earlier men, but thinking about it, these men that I'm thinking about mentioning now, they were really like contemporaries of the prophet Zechariah, living at the same time as Zechariah. But these guys were named Ezra and Nehemiah. Mm -hmm. And there's a book in the Bible called Ezra and the book of, in the Bible called Nehemiah. But these guys, Ezra and Nehemiah, were living at the same time as this prophet Zechariah. But in this time, and it's traced through the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, that Yahashua is also being shortened to Yeshua. Because it's just a little easier to say Yeshua. So, someplace in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, the Hebrew name will be referred to as Yeshua. But it's the same name as Yahashua, the full pronunciation, that is the name of Jesus in Hebrew. So when we say Jesus in English, that's only using the English language to convey a name, Jesus. But the real meaning of the character of the name is what we get from the Hebrew language. Because Yahashua or Yeshua means the Lord saves. 
and you're reading about this high priest Joshua here, Seth, in Zechariah chapter 3, verse 9, and you read, see the stone that I've set in front of Joshua. There's seven eyes on that one stone, and I'll engrave an inscription on that one stone, says the Lord Almighty. And this is what reminds me so specifically of the ministry of Jesus. And you read it, Seth, at the end of Zechariah 3.9, when you read it to us a minute ago, and I will remove the sin of this land in a single day. God says, I'll remove the sin of this land in a single day? That reminds me of Matthew 121, because Jesus is being referred to in Matthew 121 as the one who in the Greek would, at a point of time, at a given point of time, not a progressive, ongoing, it keeps happening, repeated issue, but once and for all, at one point of time, Matthew 121, Jesus will save his people from their sins, lining up with the prophecy in Zechariah 3 9, I'll remove the sin of this land in a single day. Meaning that there's one day in history where Jesus removed sin. And that day lines up with the day that he was nailed to the cross. The day that he cried out those words before he gave up his spirit, John 19.30 records it, the Gospel of John 19.30 records it, and we'll read that in just a moment. We'll read John 19 verse 30 in just a moment, but before we do, we're going to check with Nicole because I think she may have something. I just have a question. Uh, um, why is the sin associated with the land and not the people? Like, why doesn't it say it's well, removing the people's sin, but well, the land's Well, that's sin. a very interesting question that I've never Nicole... i noticed that before. Well, that's a very, very, very interesting question because in Old Testament usage, there are examples that we could go to if we did have time to notice the principle of association which is a huge principle in the Old Testament. You know, the, the issue of association is huge. And it just means that because the people lived on the land, whatever was happening to the people was going to be happening to the land. So if the people were punished, the land was punished. Okay. And if the people were forgiven, the land was forgiven. Okay. And there, there are some examples we could go to, you know, if we had the time. But, but this principle of association is so big that if the people were cursed, the land that they lived on was cursed. If the people were blessed, the land that they lived on was blessed. Now, there was a scripture that I was just going to think about sharing. John chapter 19 verse 30. Now is there a way George that you could just read that to us in John 19 30. Now before George reads that I want to say that my goal in it was to talk about one the character of Jesus expressed in the meaning of his name that he would at a point of time save his people from their sins that be he would cancel the guilt of their sins and he would do it at a point of time, he'd remove the sin of the land in a single day. Well, that's one aspect of what I hope to do, but another aspect of what I hope to do was to talk about the fact that the Greek word for save also means heal. So that when Jesus saves you, there's another aspect of his ministry where he actually heals you from what it is inside of you that would cause you to sin in the first place. And that's another aspect of the message. But my goal was to get to both aspects him canceling the guilt of sin, number one, and then secondly, healing you from what caused you to sin in the first place. But for right now, we're at John 19, verse 30. And George, I believe, has it to read it in John 19, verse 30. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. 
With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. When he'd received the drink, he said, it is finished. Now, we, we understand from, from Mark's research, principle of association, I've done the research, he's going to get credit for it. We're members of one body here. We're all going to get credit. Because God looks at us not just as individuals here, he looks at us as members of one body. Okay. And, and Mark, the, the thought is that, that in archaeology, you know, when they dig in the earth because they want to find artifacts or things from the ancient world that they can discover things about what they can discover by digging into the earth and finding things that were lost that are buried in the earth from generations ago. They're, they're digging in, my understanding is, the late 1800s and they're discovering the ancient receipts of taxes that were paid ancient receipts of taxes that were paid and they have this Greek word written across it paid in full and the same Greek word is being mentioned the paid in full meaning of the word the paid in full meaning of that Greek word it's the Greek word that's mentioned here in John 19 verse 30 the Greek word translated into English in the NIV as it is finished could actually be translated as paid in full so George, could you read that John 19.30 and just insert the translation paid in full when you get to it is finished? Okay, so he's just going to read again John 19.30. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is paid in full. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. So, so I'm just getting excited over here because when Jesus received the drink as he was on the cross and he uttered the words, it's, it's paid in full, then that means that what Jesus did was he fulfilled his ministry. That he would at a point of time finish the work that was to be accomplished by his death, which death was going to equal the forgiveness of sin and the cancellation of debts and was going to mean that his people would be saved at that point of time from their sins when Jesus uttered the words it's paid in full after that it was now time for him to bow his head and give up his spirit because once he gave up his spirit then his body died and remember when he said earlier in John chapter 10 remember when Jesus said no one takes my life away from me I give away my life because it's my choice to do that. Do you remember that in John chapter 10? Do you remember where he said that, Nicole, in John chapter 10? Do, do, do you happen to recall from, from your study on this which verse it is in John 10 where Jesus says, No one takes my life away from me. I lay down my life of my own accord, as if to say, of my own decision. It's, it's the section in here where Jesus is talking about, I'm the good shepherd. George found it? 1018. George, go ahead and read 1018. Go ahead and read 1018. John 1018. No one takes it, my life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my Father. Okay, so John 1018. You know, Jesus is saying, no one takes my life from me. I'm willfully obeying my Father and doing His command by fulfilling my ministry of giving up my spirit on the cross resulting in the death of my body which death is going to be the payment which cancels the guilt of sin for His people for His people And then he said, not only do I have authority to lay my life down in this way, but I also have authority to resurrect, to decide on the third day, I'm just going to come back to life because I, I've paid the sin debt through my death and I've been out of the body for long enough because I gave up my spirit, meaning it, my spirit left my body, which resulted in my body's being dead. But now, having paid for the sin and everything, 
on the third day, I, I'm just deciding I'm going to wake up from the dead people and I'm going to come back to life and I'm going to prove that I'm the Messiah, the Son of God, the Savior of the world because it's time for me to resurrect. I received authority from my Father to lay my life down. I received authority from my Father to take up my life on the third day. So I'm just obeying the Father by, you know, dying because I choose to die and come back to life because I choose to come back to life. This command I received from my Father to do both things. Lay down my life and take it up again. But what is the result of this? He saved His people from their sins at a point of time. He removed the sin of the land in a single day, says the prophet Zechariah. Zechariah 3.9. But, but the question is, who are His people? Who are His people? I mean, that's a good question. Who are his people? I mean, who are his people that he saved from their sin on that day that he gave up his spirit? Who did he save from their sins? Whose guilt did he cancel? I mean, when we read about the prophecy in Matthew 121, one aspect of, of this is, is for real, that, that we know for sure. I mean, there's no doubt about this aspect. Aspect, I say, because it's not the end of the story. It's just an aspect. But one aspect for sure that we know is that when he saved his people from their sin, we know he was fulfilling prophecy in Psalm 130, verse 8. I mean, that's one aspect of knowing uh, people that he saved from their sin. Well, one aspect for sure is Psalm 130, verse 8. And... Mark, I think you're going to have a, a version that's going to be good for this in the New American Standard Version here. You've got Psalm 130, verse 8, and look at this statement. God Himself is speaking, but I say Jesus fulfills this prophecy because the same prophecy that calls Him Jesus two verses later calls Him Emmanuel. And I'm referring to the fact that in Matthew 1, 21, he's, His name is Jesus which means he'll save his people at a point of time from their sins. But two verses later, he's called Emmanuel. And Matthew 1.23, calling him Emmanuel, also defines the name, the name of the Hebrew Emmanuel, because Emmanuel is a Hebrew name. And in Matthew 1.23, that Hebrew name Emmanuel is defined. And it's said there, it means in the Greek, to English, with us the God. Matthew 1.23, Greek to English, Emmanuel translates to the English expression, with us the God. In other words, we're talking God Himself became a human being in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. But to fulfill this prophecy where God is speaking in Psalm 130 verse 8, and Mark is going to read us, this prophetic message of Psalm 130, verse 8. And he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Okay. And he, referring to God in context, will redeem, meaning set free because of the payment of a ransom. A ransom payment that sets the people free from slavery to whatever their issue is. And in this case, it's the issue of being a slave to sin. He Himself, God, in Psalm 130, verse 8, will redeem, will pay the price, will ransom the people, will free them from all. But, but Israel is the one being referred to in Psalm 130, verse 8. So Israel is the one being referred to here. So He will redeem Israel from all His iniquities. Iniquities is a fancy way of talking about sins. He will ransom, pay the price to free Israel from all his sins. We talked about the principle of association earlier that's so strong in Psalm 130 and the rest of the Old Testament. Well, the principle of association is that every member of the ancestor named Israel, when I say member, I'm saying that every descendant of the ancestor named Israel is considered a member of Israel's body. So that as all the members of a body form one identity, 
all the descendants of this ancestor named Israel form one identity. Throughout the generations, every time another Israeli is born, another member was added to the body of the ancestor Israel. Because he's an ancestor Israel, read about in the book of Genesis, but he lives on through the generations. He lives on through the generations. Why? Because he keeps having children that keep adding members to his body. The association factor of all his descendants are regarded as an extension of who he is, Israel, who just lives through the generations because he keeps having children to carry on his name. So, in prophecy, Psalm 130, verse 8, he himself will redeem Israel from all his sins. So one thing for sure, in Matthew 121, who are his people that at a point of time he would save at the cross from all their sins? Israel is, you know, for sure, because it fulfills prophecy in 130, Psalm 130, verse 8, he himself will redeem Israel from all his sins. Well, Israel's covered by, by, by the, the payment that Jesus made offering up His blood as a sacrifice on the cross. I mean, Israel's covered. So if you identify with Israel, you know, if you're a descendant of that guy in the book of Genesis, Israel, hey, guess what? The good news is He saved you from your sins. And that's the good news on that level. He can't save you from the guilt of your sins. Now, being healed from the issue of having to sin in the first place is another subject, which we hope to get to tonight, obviously, in our goal. But just to say for introduction's sake, the good news is Israel is he saved you from your sins. But but there's another aspect of that. There's another aspect. And it's a good thing that there's another aspect because I myself was not born of Israeli descent. So it's, it's actually good news to me that there's another aspect because otherwise I would have been left out because I wouldn't have been Israel according to flesh and wouldn't have been a descendant of Israel to be covered by the good news in the name of Jesus that he saved me from my sins when he went to the cross with me in mind. So there's another aspect of it. And the, the statement that, that just amazes me about this other aspect is a statement summarized by this short little sentence in Ephesians 3.6. And, and if we go to Ephesians 3, 6, let me see if, if Seth is willing. Um, Ephesians 3, 6. Okay. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and shares together in the promise in Christ Jesus. Okay, the mystery here, the Greek word mysterion, means in English like secret. You know? The, the secret, if you will, is that through the gospel, which is a word that means good news, the Gentiles... Now, who are the Gentiles? The Gentiles are the nations. We actually get the word in English, ethnic, from this Greek word. In other words, Gentiles refers to the nations. So if you belong to a nation other than Israel, you're included in the good news stated in Ephesians 3.6. If, if you're, you know somebody that identifies with a nation other than Israel, then you're covered by the good news stated in Ephesians 3.6. If you're not one of the nations other than Israel, you're covered by the statement in Psalm 130, verse 8, He Himself will redeem Israel from all His sins. But if you're not of Israel, you're covered by the good news in the statement of Ephesians 3.6, you're one of the nations other than Israel. So, in Ephesians 3, 6, the good news is, the, is a mystery, it's a secret. But in Ephesians 3, 6, the secret is that the good news states that the nations of the world are heirs. Now, heirs means 
that God is your Father and God is going to give you an inheritance. He's going to give you blessings. He's going to share of His property with you. Why? Because you're His children, so He gives you an inheritance. The nations, in Ephesians 3, 6, the nations are heirs. They're going to inherit the land. The land that God promised to Abraham. And this land is something that I would love to be able to talk about more in terms of the implications of the land and how the land, you know, lets us have the theme of the kingdom of God and, and after a future resurrection, how living in the land and getting your inheritance in the land is synonymous with getting your inheritance in the kingdom of God and all that stuff, which is another subject. But for the moment, Ephesians 3, 6, the secret is that the good news is that the nations are heirs together with Israel. Together with Israel. And members together of one body. The principle of association is as being part of the people of God. Like members of one body, you know, the, the body of, of the anointed guy, you know, the king, the prophet, and the priest. He's the king of Israel, he's the priest of Israel, the prophet of Israel. But if you're members of the one body that Israel is members of, then you're members of the same body that Jesus is a member of because he's Israeli and the head of that Israeli body. And if you're members of that body, you're associated with being the people of God just by being one of the nations. According to the secret of the good news, that the nations are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and shares together in the promise. The promise in anointed Jesus. In other words, the promise that's fulfilled in the faithfulness and the obedience of the anointed Jesus. Jesus Himself is the entitlement to the nations and to Israel of all the blessings of God in the good news. Which means in Matthew 1.21, Jesus' character is revealed in the fact that He's about to be born as a little boy, a Jewish boy, an Israeli boy, but the angel tells Joseph, name your boy Jesus because at a point in time he'll cancel the guilt of his people's sins. Well, who are his people? Israel, plus all the other nations of the world. So who are his people? Everyone on the planet is in this perspective of what opens up another subject which we don't have time to go into and that is all the scriptures in the Old Testament that say that the nations are, are children of God as well as Israel because that whole theme of Ephesians 3, 6, you know, what Paul says is a mystery, a secret about the nations are included as children of God with Israel as children of God. Well, it's not that it's a mystery or a secret in the sense that it never showed up in the text of the Old Testament. It's a mystery because when people read the Old Testament in the first century, they tend to miss it. They tend to read past the verses. They tend not to see the texts that say that the nations are heirs together with Israel. They, they, 